we're talking about rotational motion, but we do want to connect it to circular motion because that comes up in a lot of problems and everyday occurrences. So we're going to take our wheel and we're going to set it into rotational motion, definitely rotational, but we're going to think about a point on the wheel and you'll realize that any little point on the wheel is also, it's actually going under, going through circular motion. So the wheel's rotating, but that little point, the yellow piece of tape, is going circular. Circular is a special kind of translational motion. So if you zoom in really tight on that yellow piece of tape and watch it fly by, if you just look really narrow, it looks like it's just flying by in 1D motion with a little bit of curvature. So these are the connections we want to think about. So here it is. Here's our wheel going around, right? And our object might be here at one point. Our piece of tape might be there. And then later, maybe it's there. Um, if I wanted to do this with proper vectors, I would say the motion is going uh, this way. Therefore, the angular velocity vector points out like that. Because I use the right-hand rule, my fingers go around with a motion. My thumb sticks out in the omega vector. Let's think about the wheel having a radius r. And uh, we're going to think about the difference between these two positions. We'll call them 1 and 2. And let's say it goes around by theta, an angle theta. So there's a little brief part of that uh, circular motion. So the first relationship we want to look at is not the velocity. That's usually where books and people start. But let's go all the way back to the distance. This is the simplest fundamental one that often gets skipped. When we first started in uh, regular translational motion, the first thing we thought about was distance and displacement and position. So let's look at the relationship here. If we were going to talk about distance in uh, rotational motion, it's theta. It goes around in theta. But we can connect that with s. s equals theta times r. Okay, so this is the first one. And s is the arc length. All right? It's this path, it's the, the length of that path going around the angle. It is a curved path. It's not even a straight path. And it is not the displacement from 1 to 2. Right? So we're not going that far into translational motion, back to day 1. But we, in translational motion, we talked about the distance of a path. So it's like the distance of this curved path. That's a very simple relationship that you know we often don't write down in beginning physics it really if you want to think about it it just comes from uh, the formula for the circumference right you know that if you go all the way around that's a circumference and that equals well what stayed all the way around is 2 pi 2 pi r so you can think of it that way it's really just the fundamental definition of an arc length all right so those two positions went and uh, through an angle theta and through an arc length theta r let's see so now let's look at now let's look at velocity well, how we get from distance to velocity is take a derivative. Right, so we're going to do a time derivative of this. Time derivative of moving along the circle, ds dt would basically be the speed v. And uh, then r is a constant, right? Big R is a constant. And theta is changing. So we say d theta dt. But d theta dt we know is omega. So we can also say the speed v is r omega for this object on the edge of the wheel. So this is just a speed. If we wanted to get technical and call it a vector, we know uh, this doesn't really tell us the direction. This is just telling us the magnitude. The direction of v, we know from our circular motion, is tangent to the circle. So this would be the vector v. But this quick formula just gives us the speed. It clearly doesn't give us the direction, because the direction of omega and v are not, not the same. Um, so I'll say the direction, if you need it, is tangent to the circle. Now you can see it kind of depends on where we put the little object. So for now, I've put the object all the way out at r. What if I put a second object here? So I'll find that yellow piece. And now I'll put a little piece of green tape closer in, like that. And I'll give it a spin here. And now we can zoom in and watch both pieces of tape go by and see which one is going faster. So you can see the yellow is going faster. And the reason is the, the, uh, the speed you get is proportional to the radius. 
right? So if we have the yellow piece of tape at a big radius and the green piece of tape at a smaller radius, the yellow is going faster than the green. But they're both going at omega, okay? What do we do in kinematics? When we don't know what to do, we take a derivative. So let's take another derivative to get the acceleration. Oh, yes, derivative of speed would be the acceleration or the magnitude of the acceleration. Uh, the derivative here, r is a constant. We're up to d2 theta dt2 or d omega dt. That is just the angular acceleration that we talked about, alpha. Right? A equals r times alpha. Now, kind of like here, this is just sort of a magnitude. We've got to add a little bit more detail to the story. I need to put a t here before I box this equation because this is only, whoops, I just invented a letter. This is only the tangential acceleration. The tangential acceleration, uh, you can think of as the component due to uh, speeding up or slowing down. Down. So if you have your wheel spinning at a constant omega, then this is zero. There is no tangential acceleration. But if you have a case where the wheel is speeding up because you maybe have a weight pulling on it and creating a torque and speeding it up, or if you're slowing it down like we did in the other demo when we stopped the wheel, then you'll have a tangential acceleration. But you want to remember that there's also that other kind of, when we're thinking about circular motion, there was also the centripetal acceleration. So remember that there was AC is the speed squared over R. So this isn't replacing this, it's just another component. This is still true. While the object goes around, it still has centripetal acceleration. We could even, though, write it in terms of rotational quantities if we want. You can see if we just plug this in here, we get R omega squared. There you go. So we can get both components of acceleration. And just to draw them and to try to really clarify what it would look like in a diagram, because people get very concerned about tangential and radial acceleration. If we have our circular motion, and we have an object here, and it's got omega here, because it's going around like that, it's got speed like that, and let's say omega and v are increasing. Let's say the magnitude of omega is increasing. Let's think about the total acceleration then. Well, if it's going that way at a speed v at this moment in time, it has centripetal acceleration pointing in, like that. And it also has, so AC equals R omega squared, but it also has tangential acceleration because it's speeding up around the curve, right? And that's equal to what we just got, R times the angular acceleration. And that is also, since it's V, it's increasing, it's along, it's tangent to the circle. So we draw that one kind of like that, right? There's the AT part. So the total acceleration is just the vector sum of those two. Since they're always perpendicular to each other, they really just make vector components in a little Cartesian coordinate system that spins around the circle. Right? So if I had to draw the total acceleration vector, there it is, A. But for this kind of motion, we always break it into those components. Sometimes you'll see this called the radial acceleration. If it's radial, that just means the positive direction is out. And you say it's r squared omega, but you put a negative sign. Because centripetal, by definition, points in, but radial, by definition, points out. So that little sign might throw you off every now and then. 